She is the director of the new Demos Center here at uh, DRE ACG, which organizes a special study abroad experience and whose year-round programming supports, promotes, and nurtures democracy through active citizenship and civic engagement. Dr. Haris Lavianos, Professor of Politics and History at DRE, will coordinate the Q&A session following the lecture. I hope you will all join us for the reception afterwards. And at this point, I would like to ask Dr. Cardaras to come to the podium to introduce the speaker. Thank you, uh, Katerina. If you had told me five years ago that I would be at DV, the American College of Greece, an institution I have admired, grown to love, and now am a part of, introducing one of the world's leading scholars in modern Greek and culture, I would have said, Pote. <laughs> Not a chance, never a chance, but here I am. Είναι μεγάλη τιμή που βρίσκομαι εδώ μαζί σας. Diddy family and honored guests, you already know her professionally. It is why you have honored Honda Van Steen to deliver the 27th Heman Fryer lecture this evening. You know she holds the Correus Chair at King's College in London. You know about all the books she has written, the lectures she has given all over the world, and the number of journal articles she has penned. This evening, though, I'd like to give you a more nuanced glimpse of this scholar, a more personal view of someone I'm very proud to call my friend and privileged to call my colleague. First, to set the record straight, she is not Dutch. <laughs> Although many call her Dutch in newspaper articles, on television and on radio, where she has frequently appeared over the past couple of years, she is actually from Belgium and is Flemish. What you also may not know about her is that she speaks the most perfect, pristine Greek, and I am jealous about that, but she knows I am trying to catch up. In fact, my Greek teacher may be here tonight who is helping me catch up. Seriously though, Honda Van Steen has changed hundreds of lives, and she changed mine, she changed my life forever. I am part of her research, come to life, a living testament of her work, and likely that is why I'm here to introduce her tonight. It was Honda who informed me that I was baby number 44488 when I entered the Vrethko Mio Athenon and when my journey as an abandoned child during a turbulent time in Greece began. I was one of 4,000 babies and children who were exported for adoption between around 1946 and the early 1970s. I consider myself one of the lucky ones. Like hundreds of others, I filled in some of the blanks to further Honda's research. Actually chosen by my grandparents, um, I went to their daughter and her husband, good parents who could not have children of their own. They were products of large Greek families, and so I retained my culture, my language, my religion. At least I knew I was born Greek. What I knew absolutely nothing about, and I'm ashamed about that, was this particular time in history. I must have been sheltered from it and had no idea I was part of a coordinated, sometimes nefarious, mass exportation of children across borders, across cultures, the first in history, before the Korean adoptees and the Chinese and all the rest, there were the Greeks. For lots of reasons and twists and turns in my life, I had all but abandoned my search for my biological parents when I came across an adoption story from the 1950s that I could not ignore. It was incredible. About a woman named Dina Pulius who was quite literally stolen from Greece, from her village of Castagna in Epiros and from her two loving parents. She was adopted by a Greek-American couple in Ohio when she was a baby. 
I asked Dina if I could write her story, and in doing so, had to do some research, which led me to an incredible book called Adoption, Memory, and Cold War Greece, Kid Pro Quo, by one Honda Van Steen. Well, of course, I inhaled the book and subsequently wrote to the author so that she could verify some disturbing information. I identified myself as a journalist and as an adoptee. She may have been turned off by the journalist part, but she gravitated toward the adoptee part and answered my query almost immediately. I thought to myself that it is usually difficult to reach academics of this caliber, well, of any caliber, but I was struck that she answered promptly and while extremely formal and professional, was both very kind and empathic. She wanted to help. And she had interviewed Dina for her book when she was at Florida State University. Her book is here, by the way, in the back of the room, translated into Greek by a respected and well-known publisher, my favorite, Potamos. The book begins with a harrowing story. Honda received a random email from the son of a Greek adoptee. For his uh, that adoptee, his mother, was the daughter of a communist who had been executed. For his political beliefs, because communists were apparently not fit to raise children and maybe could indoctrinate them, his daughter was sent away from her country and her family to be adopted in the United States. Decades later, her son was desperate to find out what happened to his mother because his life with her, while loving, was fraught with sadness and depression. And also, he wanted to know about his ancestors, the family in Greece from whom he came, who was his grandfather. It was a very, very long shot, but he wrote to a number of academics who studied Greece, its history and culture. There was only one person who answered him back, Honda Van Steen. This phone call set her off on a quest and down a rabbit hole that she never could have imagined. It was not only the history and culture of the time that she would research and write about, but she was about to make hundreds of extraordinary human connections to those we have called the lost children of Greece. In the course of corresponding with Honda and simultaneously writing the story of Dina Pulius, I was suddenly struck. Wait a minute, I said to her, are you telling me that I'm also one of these people, one of the lost children? You are one of these children, Mary, she said, and I was thunderstruck. How could I have not known what happened to me? My story was whitewashed into a beautiful, fanciful adoption story. It was not beautiful. And Honda was the one who put it all together, the puzzle of my life, sifting through documents, connecting dots, talking to people on my behalf, writing to people on my behalf, translating documents, translating conversations so I didn't misconstrue anything. That is what she did for me. She is still doing it for me, and she has done it and continues to do it for hundreds of others. This work matters because lives and families were torn apart, including mine. Yes, some were legal adoptions, but others were not. Babies were brokered. Many were stolen from hospitals right after their mothers gave birth the parents having been told their babies had died. Some were sold. This is part of our history here in Greece that must be reconciled once and for all. I have referred to Honda a number of times as the adoptee whisperer. Greek adoptees from all over the world have heard about her and have reached out. Can she help them, they ask. In addition to her important book, she has established a dense, meticulous database of the lost children of Greece. She has answers for people and often precious leads which have created some of the most beautiful family reunions. Were it not for her, this part of Greek history would have made, remained obscured and been misunderstood. She has done a great service to people like me, but even more to a country she has adopted, worked in, and has loved for most of her adult life. She is a treasure and a gift to Greece and certainly the people she has helped. Were it not for Honda, I can tell you I would not be standing here this evening. She helped me to reset a compass that was confused about its direction. And so I have returned home to work, 
to create a life back from where I came, back to my roots, my Jesus, back to my people. She is the one who lit the fire and is responsible for the embers that fly into the air, adoptees wanting their adoption records open and accessible, adoptees wanting the restoration of their Greek citizenship, adoptees all over the world and from different countries wanting justice and reform in the practice of adoption, which has created all sorts of problems for people who carry around a stigma and the pain of being ripped from their identities and their countries. Honda Van Steen is a leader in this effort. She now stands on an international stage as these initiatives are explained and negotiated in countries all over the world. But her focus is Greece, for this beautiful, progressive, re-energized country to come to terms with its history in the realm of adoption and for the 4,000 of us, many of whom lost so much and want to return home in some form as I have. Dere will be part of this history, which has not yet been made. And Dere, certainly the Demo Center, has not seen the last of Honda Van Steen. While we were sitting in the office next to the Prime Minister's office, like yin and yang, yin and yang, me, emotional, rather feisty, and impatient, she, cerebral, measured, firm, and soft-spoken. I was about to explain to the Chief of Staff of the Prime Minister um, about the importance of the unfinished business of the Greek adoptees before I could even finish a sentence with Honda's book sitting on his desk. He put up his hand and he said, Mary, I understand, nostos. These adoptees want to return and be welcome home and be provided a public <coughs> acknowledgement of what happened. As we walked from the Maximus that afternoon, Honda stopped, turned to me and said, we're going to launch a campaign called Nostos for Greek Adoptees. In her mind, right then and there, this initiative was born. And there was another idea. Would Dede, she asked, a growing institution that is doing the most interesting things, would it sponsor such a campaign? This would entail hosting a committee of academics, lawyers, a human rights activist, and an adoptee to take Honda's research to the next logical step, to use her database as the foundation to verify individual identities using the existing paperwork that the adoptee has with the archives here in Greece. Knowing Didi the way I have come to know it, I asked and it embraced the idea. Jay Sammons agreed to be the committee chair and Didi would be home for the remaining research that needs to be done. Further, it is agreed to host and celebrate when and if it happens, the symbolic return of the lost children of Greece with a ceremony, which we hope will include the restoration of citizenship, maybe right here in this room. Maybe even, Honda, you will receive an honorary Greek citizenship <laughs> for all that you have done. Like other noted academics, authors, actors, and athletes who have represented this great small country through their work and good deeds. If I were queen, I would give it to you. <laughs> Honda Van Steen is one of the finest people I know, an academic with heart and empathy, who has not only advanced the research in modern Greek studies and culture, but who has put her research to the best use, changing lives, restoring families, acknowledging history, and encouraging a culture and a country that has influenced the world over thousands of years to keep influencing, to advance, and to aspire to be its very best self. It is an honor to introduce this year's Kimon Fryer Lecture and Professor Honda MC. Well, I'm going to be blushing all the way till the end of the lecture after such a wonderful introduction. How could I not? I almost didn't recognize myself, but I have to take Mary's work for it. <laughs> 
So it's a great honor for me to be able to give the 27th Kimon Fryer Lecture. And I'll take an approach that includes myth, literature, and reality, but then also return to that activism that Mary describes. First of all, I want to thank Mary Cardenas, who flew out all the way from California on a broken leg to be able to do this introduction. I mean, there is no greater loyalty than that. <laughs> Also, I want to thank Jay Sammons, who's not with us tonight, but who has been supportive of this effort and of my work ever since we first met. I thank the president, David Horner, and the very many people here at DIRI who've made for such a wonderful visit. They have taken care of hospitality, organization, technology, even stopped the refrigerator of the apartment where I arrived. And there are many, and I'm for sure I'm gonna forget a few, but I wanna say special thanks to Dean Katerina Thomas, Helena Maranjo, Claudia Caridis, Marilena Andriadis, Nikki Kladakis, and again, a sorry to those I may have forgotten. I also wanna thank Costas Papadopoulos and Anastasia Lambria. But the most publishers has been with us from the very moment that this book didn't even exist, and they already believed in it. They have taking care of the translation through the capable hands of Ariadne Lukaki, and they're here tonight again to support our effort with copies of the book, and they're already embracing the next translation that will become part of maybe a, 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 a trilogy of works. So I couldn't have wished for any more support from Diri, from Podamos, and from all the people who I got to meet personally through this project. But I also want to thank you. You devoted your evening to what is, after all, a very complex and a ve very difficult topic. The last word hasn't been said. So thank you for being here in such big numbers. I welcome your questions, and I thank Haris Flavianos for moderating the session afterwards. And of course, you can always find me over a glass of wine, sure, and, uh, and ever after. I do respond to email. I since 2013, I've been looking more critically at the story of Cold War international adoptions. My study of the historic Greek adoptions must inform, hopefully, the ongoing debate about international adoption that is still couched in a rhetoric of those lucky kids, that rosy narrative that has erased, actually, the birth family and the culture of origin. Many adult international adoptees tell of a painful side of the adoption fairy tale, but they have very few academics or advocates on their side. And I like this image from the Kendra of Rivon Mitera, where you see a birth mother kind of disappear in anonymity. Her grief exists, but it's also a disenfranchised grief, a grief that uh, can, cannot be spoken, that is almost not allowed to have a name. With my recent research in activism, I've been delving deeper into the social and the family dynamics in the sending country, Greece, but also in the supposedly promised land of the orphan's arrival, the USA. This close focus then on young individuals and mid-20th century private politics challenges not only Greece's narrative, grand narrative, but also that of the global and imperialist West. Meanwhile, I find myself frequently standing by the side of searching adoptees and acting as their translator and interpreter, following their directions. And I'm reminded, I'm reminded at what a formidable language barrier the Greek language really is and how we are all badly in need of it. And I bless the days that I actually started with ancient Greek to be able to make something of Katarevusa. <laughs> Their feedback, the adoptees' feedback, is raw and honest, but I welcome it. They feel empowered to reclaim their voices, to be heard in that daunting process of root searching and negotiating access to archived records, if they exist. Our repeated presence and the urgency of our requests, also for Greek citizenship, have already begun to change public perception. But yet, we have so much more work to do to achieve institutional change and the kind of political will that will translate into concrete action. Also, this campaign remains a collective effort with and on behalf of the adoptees, including the quite large number of those who are no longer with us. 
This talk then opens a dialogue about the major social and family phenomenon. Adoption is, after all, a practice steeped in tradition, but always oriented also towards the future. And it's certainly fertile soil for the exploration of many other related topics. It can lead to further research in social and intellectual history, in economic, political, and diplomatic history. But here today, I'm interested in the reception in literature about child relinquishment, in the status of the illegitimate child in adoption historically. This is a talk perhaps also about strong opinions and emotions which the topic inevitably raises. It derives just as feelings are running very high about the future of cross-border adoption, but also commercial surrogacy and identity politics as we understand them now in the 21st century. But I, I dare say also the commodification and even the weaponization of children. Think of how the children are being used in the Russian-Ukrainian standoff. But that does not mean that these emotions and demands are entirely in and from the present. I want to show you that they are already anchored in the Greek psyche, in Greek literature and myth, starting in antiquity. My research on children's adoptions from Greece to the USA in the 1950s and 60s, mainly 4,000 of them, leads me then to look at texts from ancient and modern Greek literature with new eyes. So I will cover some topics from 5th century BC tragedy and specifically Sophocles' Oedipus, but I will also explore how the modern field of adoption study and its terminology may help us to reconceptualize, for instance, the famous story by Yorgos Vizinos, Tom Artematis Mitrosin, My Mother's Sin. But let me start then with a gentle warning, the one expressed by Oedipus' servant when Oedipus had not quite seen the light yet, but he soon would. The servant says, ah, I'm close to saying what I dread to say. And Oedipus says, hmm, and I to hearing it, but I must hear it all the same. I start with Euripides Melanipe. Euripides' lost play Melanite allows me to start where all adoption stories start, with the moment of conception, a pregnancy coming to play, and a pro in the, the possibility or danger of child relinquishment. But also with the story of fragments, lost texts, lost stories, lost letters. Very familiar scenario to the adoptees. It lets us reflect on the role of the birth mother and how it did plays out. Why she called Melanipe the wise. The reconstructed plotline of the controversial tragedy is as follows. Melanipe is the young daughter of King Aeolos and Hippo. Through her father Aeolos, Melanipe is the granddaughter of Helen, the ancestor of all Greeks. Poseidon has left Melanipe pregnant, and he then forces her to abandon the twin baby boys. But Melanipe is psychologically and intellectually a very strong character, despite her young age. And she defends her right as a woman and as a mother who wants to keep her children. Melanippe's rhetorical skill and reasoning prompt the male members of her family to see her and her twin sons as a threat to the social order, as a threat to be eliminated. Thus, Euripides' tragedy introduces somewhat of a proto-feminist perspective arguing for women's and mothers' rights. And it was a controversial tragedy for that reason. And it calls out male dominance and the stigma resting on fatherless children. Up until the early 1980s, modern Greek society would call fatherless children illegitimate, exogama, and worse. The tragedy calls out not only the absent partner and father Poseidon, but also the relentless Helen, Melanippus' grandfather, who wants to see the twin boys thrown into the fire to disappear them. Thus, the tragedy places illegitimate offspring, the young, unwed mother, at the front line of suffering. It is not the children who are illegitimate, it's the motherhood that is not allowed. It's a disenfranchised pain of the mother who's not allowed to be a mother. Here, too, it's the pain of not knowing what the future will bring, not knowing what will become of the boys. It takes a deus ex machina 
in the person of Melanita's mother to resolve the crisis and to spare the heroine's life. But let's remember that the gods from the machine only have ever appeared in fiction or myth, certainly not in real life. Here are the twin boys of Melanippe on this wonderful vase painting. Then I want to pick up with a story from modern Greek literature, Yorgos Vizinos, Toa Martimatis Mitrosmo, My Mother's Sin. The story is from 1883. Vizinos describes a mid 19th century adoption ritual in his native trace. The story also introduces another prominent party in what has been called the adoption triangle, meaning the birth mother, the adoptive mother, and the adopted child. Mm -hmm. Let me read then one of the most critical passages from Vizinos's somewhat mainly autobiographical story that thematizes not only adoption but also guilt and atonement in an atmosphere of psychological realism. The translation is by the late Peter Mackridge, whom we remember dearly. After the church liturgy, we all stood before the icon of Christ, where Amid the surrounding throng and in the presence of her natural parents, my mother took her adopted daughter from the priest's hand and, having first sworn in the hearing of all those assembled to love and to nurture her as though she were flesh of her flesh, our relatives and those of our own sisters followed us to our front gate, while the, where the elder lifted the girl up high and displayed her for a few moments in front of the assembled people. Then, in a loud voice, he asked, Which of you is more apparent or relative of this child than Despignon Michael Yessa and her family? The girl's father was pale and gazed sorrowfully in front of him. His wife leaned on his shoulder, weeping. My mother trembled with fear, lest anyone should shout, I am, and thus toward her happiness. But no one answered. So the child's parents kissed it for the last time and went away with their relatives, while our relations went in with the elder and were entertained by us. Vizinos describes an adoption practice as it used to be handled in pre-modern Greece. A child is placed with a different family within the same small community and there is no secrecy surrounding this placement. In fact, the adoption is deliberately made public in the hope that once executed, it will never be contested. The, the principle is, speak now or forever hold your peace. What Vizinos describes is the procedure of the simple adoption, which was common in Greece up to the 1940s. This type of adoption stems from the paradigm of Roman law, ancient Roman law, which took care first of all aging adults and only then of an orphan child. In fact, this child is not even an orphan, but it may materially benefit from the adoption. The adoption described by Vizinos came about because the adoptive mother perceived a deep need to obtain this child. The girl of the story is not an orphan in need of a family. In fact, she has one, and a very loving one too. But a family that relinquishes the child to give her a better life, again speaking materially. This type of simple adoption was meant also to enlarge the circle of people caring for the child. But in Vizionos' text, the implication is that the birth parents will not continue to be involved in the girl's upbringing, thereby honoring what are the very strong preferences of the very strong-willed mother. But Vizinos urges the reader, reader to also think critically about the, the psychosocial question of what is actually the sin of the mother. Is it that she accidentally killed her first daughter, as happened? Is it that she declares herself ready to even see one of her sons die, as long as the life of the second daughter may be saved? Or is it that she usurps the child of a loving family and makes it her own, without pursuing the option of giving an, an, a home to an orphan child, which may actually have needed one? After the 
1940s, Greece made a transition to a different kind of adoptions, the so-called full adoptions, which cut off all legal ties with the birth families and communities, and override, overrode the, the child's identity, name, religion, and nationality in, in the case of adoptions abroad. These full adoptions were also called new, or Western style, or even American style adoptions. And they're most often what we call stranger adoptions. A child and a couple are matched and become a new family, even though before they were total strangers to each other. To protect this modern, initially quite experimental and rather precarious legal arrangement, the full adoptions cloud themselves in the mantle of confidentiality and secrecy that was actually totally absent from the village environment of Vizinos. With an anachronistic stretch of the imagination, one could call the adoption of Oedipus a full adoption or a stranger adoption. It too severed the legal identity ties, emotional ties, with the original family. Oedipus was given a name, legal and new legal and family identity, and actually also a new polis and court culture. This pattern was, of course, never formalized in mythical time, but it is the operative pattern of post-war international adoption, which affects the vast majority of cases. Like Oedipus, an infant stranger, often a foundling, goes to stranger adopt adoptive parents to start a new family with them, while questions, however, about <coughs> the origins continue to loom large. The tight secrecy surrounding adoption must sustain the desired irrevocability of the act of adoption. Adoptive parents do not want to give back the child they have been raising. Understandably so. The relinquishing parents may not necessarily want to take the child back, given the tremendous damage that such a new act of rupture might actually cause. So enter the adoption movement across geographical borders. Intercountry or international or transnational adoption, which is very often not also translate racial adoption. The underlying principle has not changed since that mythical day when a servant shepherd took Oedipus across the border of his police. The physical border crossing must warrant that the adoptive placement cannot be revoked. The geographical distancing must make it highly unlikely that birth parents and adoptive parents will ever meet. Such a promise enticed Oedipus's new parents too, given the baby's transfer from Thebes to Corinth. The post-World War II era saw a huge increase in international adoptions, but typically in a unilateral flow, a flow from, cold, uh, from poor Cold War allies, Greece, to wealthy Cold War leaders, the USA. Many adoptive parents wanted the security that international adoption could offer, namely the certainty that the Greek birth parents would never appear on the doorstep to reclaim their child. The cross-border adoption system delivers exclusive parenthood, which then rests with the adoptive parents in the child's new location. Appropriate legislation for the category of full adoption then further guarantees that the birth parents no longer have any legal or even moral claim on their child. Movement to space ensures irrevocability, but it's also movement from legal procedures to class divides and through formidable language divides. Some objects, however, physical objects, such as notes left by the birth parents, mark and soften the above described hard transitions. Some objects too morph into lifelong reminders of distress for the adoptees, for remaining so rough around the edges. Those left with foundling children can be such material tokens that undercut positive remembrances. The Vrevocomio Patron, the Patras Orphanage, collected many of such notes left with children by supposedly birth mothers. At least we have to presume they were birth mothers who left the note and the child. But it stopped displaying them after 2014. The reason is that we showed up a few too many times and took a little too much interest in these notes. The picture in, at the top was taken in 2014 by Greek adoptee Maria, 
who more than anyone understood the importance of the notes. The notes describes the need of the child as purely material. It's a harsh note in a matter-of-factly diagnosis. The notes author appeared determined to give up a male child just one week after it was born. In a vaftisto, in a spasmeno de podaratitu, tu echo mia pana, mia kuvartula, ke ora in de kamisi, de kafta, ok do, ek zin daifta, in mera pemti, ki te tarti, tis, stis, en jatu minos, e genitike. Ke tas as parakaleso polina, tu kane te mia exeta si emotos. It's not baptized, its little leg is broken, I have one diaper and one little blanket for him. The time is 11.30 <coughs> on the 7th, 17th of August, 67, Thursday. He was born on Wednesday, the 9th of the month. And may I please ask you to do a blood test on him, with spelling mistakes and all. What became of this little fungling Oedipus of 1967 with his broken leg? What was the fate of this child of a modern Tichy? Oedipus had ominously stated, I see myself as a child of Tihi that brings good fortune. Material fragments and notes take on new shapes and meaning when they start to inhabit the lives of real people, the adoptees of fortune. This baby Oedipus came with instructions, and his likely premeditated abandonment certainly debunk debunks a few romanticized notions about the first parents. A scar of abandonment was likely added to his bodily wound. The piercing of his identity is now a fact, even as that life is still to unfold. In the picture you also see the infamous Vrefo Dojos, or the, the slot where babies could be left behind anonymously at the Vrefo Comio Patron, the orphanages in Athens, uh, in Patras in Athens, and at Ayostilianos in Thessaloniki. This was common practice. And then a newspaper article about a foundling girl. But let's not delve deeper into the quintessential adoption story from ancient myth, Sophocles' Oedipus. Sophocles' signature tragedy presents Oedipus as the quintessential searcher, and that's a word from adoptive parlance. The play also allows us to identify and know adoption's perennial risk and anxieties. What does the lack of knowledge inflict on the adopted person? How do scant hints and the deliberate withholding of information affect the process of the adoptee's identity formation? Can labyrinthine and bloody droughts to roots be avoided? Can tragedy altogether be averted? Is heredity necessarily fate? These are some of the questions that can be addressed by rethinking the myth and the play of Oedipus from the perspective of the Greek-born adoptees who were placed in these American adoptive families of the post-war and early Cold War period. So I will use modern terminology associated with the state of being adopted, the state of the adoptee, that third leg in the adoption triangle. So I, I do a little bit of a project of reception in reverse, applying some anachronistic terms back onto the Oedipus play. I know that this is not entirely kosher, it may not entirely be accurate for ancient myth, but I'm going to take my encouragement from Hegel, who said, especially about Sophocles' tragedy, that it continued to generate no meanings, no answers to public as well as private questions. Of course, you know the storyline. The young Oedipus grew up thinking that Polybos and Merope, the royal couple of current, were his biological parents. For many years, he had never shown any signs of doubt about his parentage. Once he's come of age, however, Oedipus sets out on a circuitous journey, which symbolizes his emotional as well as geogra geographical withdrawal from current, but also the labyrinthine quest for identity. This spatial and mental journey leads him to the notorious crossroads where he unwittingly kills Laios, his natural father. Oedipus then delivers the city of Thebes from the destructive Sphinx and he earns the hand of the queen, Jocasta, who happens to be his biological mother, without either one of them realizing it. By doing so, Oedipus fulfills the oracle that he was given in Delphi all the while trying hard to escape it, 
by running away from his Corinthian adoptive parents. The truth about Oedipus origins and adoption is the very last truth revealed in Sophocles', in Sophocles play, but it's also the one truth that makes sense of all the others. And here you see an adoptee staring at the Rio and Dirio bridge in the hope that answers will come from there. Many of, our, of, of the adoptees who were sent to America came from the Patras orphanage. So there's a constant pilgrimage, if I may say, back to Patras for that particular reason, to find cues. The disposal of the newborn by the birth parents, Lais and Jocasta, functions as the axis from which the tragic narrative unravels. The adoptee's ensuing quest for identity forms the trajectory of the play. Oedipus route to roots becomes his quest to define his selfhood, which makes the public and the private intertwine, first in Corinth and then in Thebes, and eventually in Colonus near Athens, where the hero receives his final resting place, as in the eponymous play by Sophocles again, Oedipus at Colonus. But Oedipus' identity proves to be a confused and distorted concept, a moving target through no fault of his own. Trauma, in the very fear of trauma, further propelled the play as Oedipus remains preoccupied, obsessed even, with recovering the facts about his childhood. Over time, Oedipus' painful quest for literal origins at least gives way to a more symbolic and figurative understanding of the facts and also of the meanings of adoption, the personal, but also the political, the social, and the cultural accretions. Oedipus' search, which begins as an inquiry into the cause of the plague in Thebes, is followed by his hunt for the killer of Laios, and then it becomes the full story and the total tragedy, private and public alike. Now, according to Sophocles' play, Oedipus was named after the swollen wounds on his feet. Significantly, however, the wounding and the naming occur in two different geographical locations. The birth father, Laios, did not outright kill his newborn son, but he pierced his feet to render him unappealing for any kind of rescue. The child was to die from exposure, since his physical deformity would prevent anyone from taking him in as a foundling. This relates to the widespread ancient Greek belief bias, actually, against physical disabilities. Now, considerations of blood pollution aside, this scenario raises the question, did those birth parents, consciously or subconsciously, allow an opportunity ever so narrow for a later recognition, an agnosis, or a family reunion to occur? Just how badly was the baby wounded? Sophocles entertains an aporia about the newborn's condition, but also about the natural parent's psychological state. Were they sure that they never, ever wanted a reunion with their own child? The act of piercing the infant's feet was the only sign of identity that the biological parents bestowed on their child. Laios did not name the baby boy. In classical Greece, formal name giving was part of the ritual through which a father accepted the child as his into the household. Laios does not do that. Of course, the, the, the identity marker of the broken, uh, the pierced wound, the, the wound on the leg, reminds us very much of the little baby boy of 67 with his broken leg. Now, the naming of Oedipus did not take place in Thebes, but in Corinth. And it was inspired by the baby's injuries, his only and most notable physical peculiarities. Crucially, Jocasta or any other Theban could not know the royal son's name, or they would have made the connection when they first met Oedipus as an adult. Oedipus received his name and his token wounds along with his new identity and his new lease on life. Uh, sorry, Oedipus received his name after his token wounds along with his new identity and his new lease on life from the adoptive family in Corinth. Polybus and Merope literally and symbolically received the baby boy into their childless household and with joy. But they kept his origins secret. With his given name and no lineage, Oedipus, unaware of his early history, grows into adulthood, while geographically removed from Thebes. The name Oedipus left the hero, just like many of the modern adoptees, with only minimal recognition tokens or traces from their earliest days. 
that these scant leads may spur a tremendous tenacity to go and find out more. After all, Oedipus had an early encounter with the truth that kept nagging at him. It happened when a drunken man in Corinth called him a fake son, a counterfeit son to his father. The sequence and the nature of Oedipus' circumstances resemble frequently recurring episodes in mid-20th century Greek history. They are comprised of a fragile health condition, a swift transfer to an entirely new location, a new name and presumed identity, a formal adoption, secrecy, and the adult's relentless determination to go after thin clothes. The modern context of the adoptees' relentless searches for their roots justify my use of the word identity crisis and of Oedipus' identity crisis as an apt prototype. This identity crisis is generally framed as a danger to which adopted children and shattered families altogether might be prone. When situated against the backdrop of the old, early Cold War era, however, the individual's identity crisis mirrored Greece's very own identity crisis. The identity quest of Greece as a nation, balancing precariously between West and East in the 1950s, lends credence to my argument that adoptions are not just personal or private, but social sociopolitically and often ideologically motivated. The far-flung dispersion of Greek families challenged the much doubted ideal of Greece's post-war reconstruction. The mass international adoption movement of Greek children symbolically and no less physically marked the transition to a new political and ideological status quo, which sought to balance the democratic West against the communist East. But at what cost? At the cost of life-changing decisions about hundreds of Greek children who had no say in the matter. The shaken identities of many Greek adoptees have become part of their lived experiences. They coexist today in multiple and actually rich ways with American and Dutch transnational identities because 600 Greek children also went to the Netherlands. They prove that the personal and the political stories of post-war global histo history most certainly intersect, but also that ancient drama is still an appropriate lens to which to reflect that history. How does one then practice or perform partial identity or deal with a lack of identity? In her now famous book, Lost and Found, The Adoption Experience, Betty Jean Lifton refers to Moses and Oedipus, two of the many famous cases of adoptees who've spoken to the literary and cultural imagination through the ages. And remember, they, they loom large in literature. I think uh, Dickens, think uh, Harry Potter, they loom large in literature. We do not know, she says, if Moses ever asked, who am I? We do know what happened when Oedipus asked that question. And what were the consequences of his not knowing, until it was too late? By that time, he had committed murder and incest and put out his own eyes. <laughs> Most critical discussions of the Oedipus tragedy, however, have privileged the link of the adult's self to dramatization and performance. They have pushed the theme of the infant's adoption well into the background and deep into the past. The same is true of modern adoptions. And all too often, we are told that these adoptions are a one-off act of the past and that they should remain there. A few more thoughts on the subject of Oedipus Tyrannos, on the subject then of secrecy and potential disruption. Oedipus adoption is one of the first secretly handled adoptions in Western literature. He himself feels the need to inquire how the transfer happened, and he even considers the possibility that money was involved. He literally says to the servant, and had you bought me or found me by chance when you gave me to him? Oedipus rescuers closely guarded their secret, but the occasional slip did occur. 
This mythical setting brings to mind today's terminology of what we call closed records, or sealed records adoptions, a practice shrouded in secrecy or in the current guises of necessary privacy and confidentiality. But such roadblocks obstruct the path of the average adoptee. Oedipus, however, for wielding absolute power, was able to move beyond them. The otherwise well-guarded secrecy masks the fear that knowledge about the adoption circumstances might cause some major disruptions. As if Oedipus' subsequent murder and incest were not major disruptions. For decades, secrecy prevented these two acts, murder and incest, from being discovered by the bulk of the people of the mythical city-states in question. The Oedipus tragedy details the personal shock and its impact, especially on the mother-son relationship. But it also forebodes the very real possibility of political and communal upheaval. As the tragedy's power play drives home, the subject's heredity or genealogy is also social political heritage. Given that royal adoption is at stake, one's private and family secret is necessarily a secret with public consequences. And I dare say, so are the post-war adoptions. It's not one, but 4,000 Greek children. A few words then about knowledge and faith. Jocasta and Oedipus ignored important cues that could have led to knowledge. And they did so throughout their adult life, the better part of the play. Once truth has fully emerged, Oedipus suffers the notorious second abandonment that all adopted children fear. And it's usually enacted again by the birth mother. Jocasta, who betrayed her newborn child many years earlier, again turns away from Oedipus and again rejects responsibility. Through her denial and suicide by hanging herself, she demonstrates her unwillingness to re-establish a relationship with her now knowing son, but no less with the truth. Theresias, the seer, gave Oedipus a preview of his identity, but the hero rejected it out of hand. Oedipus did not lack intelligence. After all, he solved the riddle of the Sphinx when no one else could. But he did display a blindness to all cues coming at him, or rather an unwillingness to adapt what he knew to be his life story. Take the example of the oracle itself. Oedipus likely went with the question, who am I, who is my father? The oracle answers, you know, who's my father? The oracle answers, you will kill your father and marry your mother. The two don't match. And knowing that the Delphic <coughs> oracle has a bit of a reputation in not exactly giving you a direct answer, Oedipus should have known, but he didn't. <laughs> There's a certain kind of blindness that will, of course, loom large in the play as a metaphor and a literal act. Fate, fear, the oracle, the seer, but also social standing and political prestige have prompted irrevocable decisions. In her book, Twice Born, Betty Jean Lifton notes the social control, the stigma, and the fate that constrained her own biological mother. She borrows word and words and images from <coughs> the Oedipus Smith. When I was born, society prophesied that I would bring disgrace to my mother, kill her reputation, destroy her chances for a good bourgeois life. It didn't raise an eyebrow for my father. And so a kindly shepherdess who worked in an adoption agency put me out in the marketplace where I was found by those humble folk I now call mom and dad. When I was grown like Oedipus, a fellow adoptee, I came across the Sphinx, that dark singer who waits for us all at the crossroads of identity. But I'm still struggling to answer the riddle. Brian Durius reflects on fate and free will, as well as on heredity and knowledge, in his book of 2015 called The Theatre of War. His, he describes how his biological father had been adopted, but eventually died of type 2 diabetes. And there he's right. <coughs> and like Oedipus, he discovered whose biological parents were near the end of his life, when it was too late to act upon this knowledge and avoid his own self-destruction. A few words then about chance, rupturing what has been called the conspiracy of silence surrounding adoption. Like so many children placed through the closed records adoption system, 
Oedipus discovered his adopted status by chance in that infamous encounter with the drunkard at Corinth. At dinner, a man got drunk and over wine charged me with not being my father's child. I was riled and for that day scarcely controlled myself. And on the next, I went to my mother and my father and questioned them. And they made the man who had let it slip what let slip the word paid dearly for the insult. So far as concerned them, I was comforted. But still this continued to vex me, since it constantly recurred to me. So Oedipus first heard about his adopted status from a drunk stranger in Corinth, who blurted out that he, Oedipus, was an invented or fabricated or counterfeit son to his father Polypus. The Greek word is plastos. The drunkard's word came as a complete surprise to Oedipus, who apparently never suspected that he was adopted. Clearly, Polybus and Merope must have done a pretty convincing job of parenting. But the members of their court must have assisted them, joining in what has been called the conspiracy of silence. Oedipus was not brought into the household without Polybus' knowledge. Merope did not try to pass off the new, newborn as if he were her child. In fact, classical comedy tends to suspect women of doing just that, but that's not what happened here. The baby boy was taken into the Corinthian palace most discreetly, however, nonetheless, but some people knew. Adoption is indeed one of the oldest and most iconic agreements among adults, whether biological parents and adoptive parents, or in Oedipus' case between the partners of the adoptive family who commit to raising a stranger child and whose helpers help keep the secret. Oedipus' adoption was not public knowledge in the city, which explains why the drunkard's allegations could still shock. On this early occasion, then, Oedipus' obstinacy and pride prevented the truth from being revealed. The hero sought to confirm his identity of not being adopted, and thereby not of being of low birth either. Remember how status comes in again. He kept worrying more about him being perhaps the this, this child of a slave. Also, Polybus and Merope reacted fiercely to the insult, the truth in fact, that the drunkard had hurled at the young Oedipus. The reader learns that the reaction of the Nile was vehement, but is not told what is actually said or done. Their response did appease Oedipus, however, at least at first. Therefore, Polybus and Merope likely confirmed the long-term lie and reassured Oedipus that he was theirs, their flesh and blood. But the drunkard's indiscretions kept troubling Oedipus. Later, he in turn responds <coughs> with secrecy, and this is a very common scenario in modern times. Unbeknownst <coughs> to his parents, he went to consult that famous Delphic oracle to find out about his true identity. The early incident, however, in a nutshell, prefigures what would happen later in mythic times, and repeatedly so, and no longer by chance. Theresias pronounced kept bothering Oedipus, but Jocaste is always there to discourage any further investigations. This scenario is all too familiar to today's adoptees. Statements, in fact, point in one direction, but loved ones are afraid of commotion and sometimes even derail a search, all supposedly for the child's own good. But Sophocles is there to remind us that the delayed search for one's root is risky and dangerous in the wrong kind of circumstances. Not surprisingly, the search movement of 20th century adoptees has been referring to Oedipus to dramatize the claim that adoptees need to know who their birth parents are in order to know themselves, and they need to learn under the most favorable of circumstances. A, a writer wrote in a post on Facebook, what hurts as adoptees is that the truth is kept for us, and especially anything relevant or even dramatic. If you don't understand this, reread the Oedipus play. If we are going to be left in the dark, then it's a joke for us to be left with eyes to see. As one of my interviewees has stated, processing the final accurate information is nothing compared to processing the ongoing lies. As a Russian proverb says, better to be slapped in the face with the truth than to be kissed by lies. 
Thus, the secretive adoption of Oedipus is not merely a motif in the background of the story or the myth. It is the catalyst, rather, that makes all else unravel, and it remains the very pivot of the hero's angst and crimes. For some concluding notes, then, the above case studies from ancient and modern Greek literature point to the following. There has been a consistent lack <coughs> of a safe, open space for adoptees to tell their stories, their experiences. Rather, adoptees continue to be infantilized, taken back to that baby stage of their life, that of the dependent child, for which any adoption was supposedly better than no adoption at all. This kind of a safe space has been absent for the better part of the adoptees' lives. But recently, many have found their own voices, even though it may take many years to come out of what the adoptees call the fog. And the fog stands for the gridlock of fear, obligation, guilt. A safe space for Oedipus would have been a private space. It did not help that he was such a public figure. The voice of the adoptee in Vizinos' story is completely drowned out by that of the narrator himself. And that narrator is overly focused on the material gains for the adopted girl, not on her emotional well-being. A book edited by Mary Cardaraz called Voices of the Lost Children of Greece appeared in January 2023, and it will soon exist in Greek translation, thanks to Potamos Publishers. The volume is a truthful and authentic presentation of the diverse experience of 14 Greek adoptees, only 14 or 4,000, but we have to start somewhere. They write and speak for themselves. It is the first effort of them joining together and demanding a seat at the table. It's also a book that comes 65 to 70 years after the act of the actual adoptions. This book also supports the activist agenda asking for readers on behalf of 4,000 forgotten Greek children, now adults, with urgent questions that touch deeply on topics of adopted persons' identity, well-being, and mental and physical health. They want what I call the three R's of redress. They want records, they want a sense of belonging through the restoration of their citizenship. The more records, the better chance to get that citizenship restored. Not granted, restored, because they were one citizenship. And coming from me, they want more re research. That, that's kind of my little addition, you got that. <laughs> so, Greece's 75 year long history of overseas adoptions is seeking recognition. The ongoing demands in terms of policy change, the demands of the adoptees to have their Greek citizenship restored, must be at last respectful of the adoptees' personhood. The adoptees deserve uninhibited access to their identity records. And with that, they hope to make a stronger case for the restoration of their original Greek citizenship. And it touches me, and it surprises me, time and again, how important that is for them. They really want to be restored as Greek citizens. It's where they started, it's part of their identity. Some were 14 years old when they left, they want it back. They're not asking for anything that they didn't once have. We need to hear them out when they demand their original citizenship because they lost it through no fault or decision of their own. The adoptee caused them can become an occasion for the country, Greece, and for the homogeneous, the diasporas, long-term introspection. Here are the opportunities to develop fruitful connections with the Demo Center and its strategies of transparency, advocacy, research, <coughs> and it's heartwarming that the Re wants to put its support towards it. Seeking answers to the question of the open wound of the historic adoptions, I've looked for a mirror to understand ourselves. Who am I? But also, who are we? as a society. Therefore, I've subjected Greek literary text in the predicament of the modern adoptees to an analysis to which the classicist, the theater scholar, the neo-Hellenist, the historian, and the psychologist still have a lot to contribute. But first and foremost, the adoptees have a lot to contribute. My project found its impetus in the human interest stories of post-war adoptions of many Greek-born children. But I've been trying to unlock them, and I'm fascinated all over again by the primal human interest story, which is the Oedipus myth. Nothing less than the primordial human interest story. With Oedipus, we can boldly break the spell 
on all that still blinds us. Oedipus would concur that it's about knowledge and acknowledgement, and agnorisi. And that's not just a recognition seen with the parents, but recognition of all that is actually familiar to us from prior history, culture, and myth. All that we could have or should have learned from the past. Oedipus has led, it, uh, led us to that infamous crossroads where gnosi, anagnorisi, and anagnosi may finally come to meet. Thank you. sensitive topic. Um, we have about 20 minutes for discussion. Uh, I have a question, but I'll to wait and see whether somebody from the audience would like to ask you something. Well, everybody, so I'll make the start. Uh, I was puzzled by your um, reference to the Oedipus uh, story, because uh, we all know that this Oedipus story actually ends in tragedy, so recognition, I mean, the, the quest for uh, Oedipus to find his true parents leads at the end of the play in, in total disaster. Yes, but definitely, definitely a tragedy that could have been avoided with prior, no? Yeah, but I mean, if we assume that uh, Oedipus actually didn't hear that drunkard and stayed with the adopted family, then we have a happy end. So we have a bad end. The reason why I'm asking is because there's a, a friend uh, who uh, Anastasia and of course as know, Petrus Tatsopoulos, who wrote a book entitled The, I I mean, see it on the, no. the, the Kindness of Strangers. strangers. And um, uh, sometimes this recognition creates pain on all sides. Yeah. Why do you think origin uh, is more important than love. I mean, this kind of obsession of identity, to try to find your identity. Let's say that somebody, I'm not talking about children who were stolen, as you said. Mm -hmm. Let's say some young parents actually give up their child for whatever reason, so that child is brought up in another family, in a loving family, and has a new life. Is it so easy then to, you know, somehow to go back and try to find, as you say, roots? I mean, identity is something very, uh, very floating. I mean, if you live in a country, you have an identity. Why is that other identity, the one that, you know, the origin is so important? Yeah. And doesn't this kind of recognition sometimes uh, creates more pain than actually release or you know, this kind of recognition, you say? Why is that so important? Because there are other things at stake. It's complex, but I'm not saying that one identity or one family starts replacing the other. I'm saying that the story needs to come together and the missing pieces need to be filled out, especially in adoptions of which very little was known and uh, of which very many records have been lost. So I follow the lead there of themselves who very much want to fill out that missing piece of the puzzle and, and, and put it together what the, with what they have already made of their lives. Have you ever encountered adoptees who don't want to do that? Yeah, they exist. But, but uh, there, there's a right time to do this. And a whole lot of people bottle this up, and actually Mary will speak to that as well, that the search may never be there, and then all of a sudden be there in full force. Uh, uh, there's a right time and there's a moment where it kicks in, at which case it becomes a very active search. But there are sometimes decades that go by that people are focused on their family, their career, um, the daily business of surviving, and there's just no time for that. Also because they fear it might be complex and painful and, and reopen a few wounds. But then, typically what happens is when people enter their 60s, dare I say, when adoptive parents have passed away and therefore they, something of that anchor has passed away, when they feel a sense of being an orphan all over again, that is when the questions come back with a vengeance. Mm. 
Anybody else? I see. Yes. Alicia Stalish. Yeah. A pleasure to see you, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you for, um, can you hear me? Thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, I'm sure you addressed this somewhere in the book, um, but there, there is a depiction of one of these adoptions in Hollywood with the uh, woman of the year. And I wonder, yes. um, which is sort of shocking when you see it now, but I wonder how that reads now, I mean, when you, when you see those scenes and even hear her speaking Greek and, and so on. I'm so glad you bring that up, Alicia. This is a movie from the early 1940s, and it's about, this is Hollywood now, right? It's about a very ambitious woman uh, who is in a marriage, but there's clearly kind of an, a bit of trouble with the power dynamic with her being so ambitious. And her husband decides on his own, without consulting, that they're going to adopt. Guess what? A Greek child. A Greek woman. As if, like, what? Uh, this is like your token orphan when you need one. The, 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 that's that's what struck me about it. And sure enough, uh, actually, sorry, I turn, sorry, I'm, I'm slightly mistaken. She decides to adopt it against her husband's will, and he is not okay with it. But he quite takes a liking to the child, and it becomes a little bit of a power standoff as to what they're going to do, whether they're going to focus on family life or on her career. In the end, the conflict is resolved. Guess what? Because the child go back to the orphanage. <laughs> you just kind of wonder. Uh, it, so uh, it, it irks me to see a child, a Greek orphan, so tokenized in what is a standoff between two big names in Hollywood, and it's all about the dynamics of their marital relationship, in which the orphan kind of wanders in and wanders out, just to kind of activate the plot, let's say, and activate the conflict, and then also help to resolve it by voluntarily returning to the orphanage. I find the depiction in movies startling, and one, one that always comes up in conversation is If you haven't seen it yet, you absolutely have to. It is the adoptions by Americans quintessentialized, by Greek Americans who are quite the character of Greek Americans, and clearly money is the, the, the motivator, but also you see the pain of a birth family that uh, uh, they might be that. The 13th will make the difference, supposedly. And so, yes, it's a comedy, but it's a very bittersweet comedy, which completely resolves itself miraculously in the same way that things did get resolved in real life. But uh, the silver screen is very forgiving, right? Thank you for bringing that up. Sorry, the film you mentioned before, Alicia, is, is an American family. Uh, uh, yes, this is an... Is it, is it Hebert? Is it Catherine Hebert? Yeah. And, and if, if the Greek child actually prefers to go back to the orphanage, that says very much about the American family. <laughs> well, it's quite, quite a kind of uh, condemnation of the American family. But, but interesting that it should be a Greek orphan. Yeah. Well, of all the orphans that... The Greek, probably the Greek orphan has, uh, you know, uh, the rationality of Aristotle and goes back to the orphanage. So, yeah. and, and the Greek, the Greek children become the first objects of what we call celebrity adoptions. And actually, when you look at the cover, the cover on the Greek translation of the book, uh, and this is Anastasia's choice, you see on the cover of the book, you see a picture with Princess Sophia in white, and then next to here, Jane Russell, of all people, like another Hollywood icon, uh, more known for that for anything else, uh, and, and, and she is one of the visual, the very visual, visible faces of the adoption world in the 1950s, and you also get the sense that adoption is a way to kind of reinvigorate her career, right? like it often happens, and that, again, adopted children become a little bit part of the photo of which is this picture really is. They're all at the airport and see me holding the baby, right? Yes. Thank you for a wonderful presentation and going as in-depth of so many uh, things that are, as you said from the beginning, they are linked to psychology, anthropology, the way that we treat people as families. So I want to dig into it. The question is, 
from your research, have you seen elements that have become better or changed in what we are doing now in current yeah. adoptions and international adoptions of food? Yes, yes, and I think that with the voices of the other peace rising, something is happening. But I want to give a plug to the International Social Service that has taken the initiative to actually digitize more than a thousand Greek adoption funds. And whoever is an adoptee whose adoption was handled through the ISS can actually apply to see their adoption file. For Greece, this is revolutionary. They're lit and, I mean, they just finished a project that took months, and a file is, you know, at least 50 pages, sometimes even 200 pages, you know, with observation reports, correspondence, even Christmas cards, and these people have actually understood that this is important, not just for the adoptee, who can get access, but also this will eventually, you know, give us a few more decades when personal data are no longer an issue, this will be the single richest social history archive of mid-20th century, of which the likes do not exist. So yes, it's our Mind you, I, we have more doors to knock on. And, and, and so I hold up the, this digitization project as a model, because it also means a few others haven't followed. Sorry, can you say something about the Cold War? Because one interesting thing you mentioned, but you didn't, about the Cold War. You said, you said something in your lecture about children taken away from uh, communist families yes. to be raised by, let's say, healthy families, so that won't be indoctrinated by the family. Did you spend some time researching that bit about... Yes, actually... Because that was quite interesting, like ideologically taking children away to be adopted by other families so they won't be contaminated by their yeah. own... This is actually the very first part of the book. It starts with this question of the grandson of Elias Argyriadis. Elias Argyriadis was one of the four executed in March 52, of which the most famous one is Nikos Belloyanis. So uh, two of the daughters of Elias Argyriadis had family members. In fact, they had an older sister. Uh, the, there was a larger family, but the miasma of communism supposedly affects the rest of the family. And so the children, the two girls, the two youngest girls of Elias Agiriadis, are taken to an institution and from there adopted by wealthy Greek Americans. And I emphasize wealthy, because by the time the two parties meet again, they have nothing in common. They have absolutely nothing in common. So it's one thing to not give children to the, the larger communist family, it's another to, to give them to the opposite camp, meaning free market capitalist America, right? So that by the time contact, contact happens, the descendants do not understand what this thing was that made communism, that took their uh, ancestors to the execution squad, and the people who stick behind cannot explain the, the pain of... The two Argyriadis' daughter actually at some point met the family. Uh, one of them did. One of them did. But nothing actually happened. Really. Uh, no, nothing... Uh, substantial. Nothing substantial happened because there's a language barrier. But even glass, also, glass there's a glass barrier, an ideological barrier, all of it. So they were really ideologically separated forever after. But it probably happened also with other families. It they happened with, yeah. with other families as well. But it, the, it must be said that the majority of children that were sent overseas are already children that were born in 1955 and after, and those tend to be the children of unwed mothers. The, the political adoptions, if you want, are from the very early phase, immediate post-civil war. Actually, if I may say, there is more to come on that story of Argyriadis, um, uh, the Argyriadis family, because, and I'm giving a plug to everyone else who's working on this, right? Because this is really a collective effort. But Katerina Bakoyani, the mistress of podcasts in Greece, is actually doing a podcast series on the Argyriadis story, and, and also how adoption and a search is not just for the adoptee, it's also for the next generation. 
and, and hope that that kind of silence that reigned in the household of the two girls, the adoption and, and the execution that couldn't be spoken about, how that too is inherited and drives the next generation. It's <coughs> research it. And Katharina will capture that like no other. So be on the lookout for Born Creek by Katharina Bakoyani. There's a question on, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I, I was wondering, have you ever looked at the consequences of for the adopted child uh, when he or she finds out that uh, his biological parents sold them to the family who raised him, or that the family who raised him really stole that kid from his uh, biological parents? Uh, uh, if there are such circumstances. Those are very rare. And uh, it's very hard because uh, very often those would have been the adoptive parents who didn't disclose that the child was adopted because that would open up a whole can of worms. And so it's, it's, I'm actually dealing with one such case right now. She knows that she was transacted, but she also very much loves her adoptive parents. So one, one, one comes to understand the despair with which adoptive parents seek a child. But um, there were also quite a few shortcuts taken in this uh, area. And it's very hard to explain that to a child afterward. One has to kind of live with the consequences of those transactions. And actually, this particular woman who is in the United States is actually very afraid that her American citizenship would be maybe at stake because it was obtained illegally based on a lie. She is written as a biological child of the people who actually got her. But there's no biological connection. It happens. It happens. And we keep mum about it. There's an Oedipus problem there. There's an Oedipus problem right there. But, but in the end, though, you could, say, you could say, well, what if we keep it forever secret? It doesn't exist. There's always someone who knows. Uh, honesty is the, the best path forward because what we need to avoid is that a child would learn from the drunk uncle, uh, you know, and then be, and then the shock is so much greater. There is a way to... This, on this 4,000 children, are you also looking at children on the Eastern Bloc or just on... No, I don't look at the pedomasoma. Oh, I look uh, on the, the pedomasoma of the children who were taken to the northern countries. Is a Although the child pedomasoma is a bit... It's um, loaded, loaded. But, it's loaded, but, yeah. Yeah. It won't but, be accepted by everyone. Fair enough, uh, but uh, those were very many, and most of them were not adopted. Most of them grew up in institutions, uh, and that's an immediate civil war phenomenon, and, and of course most of them stayed in those countries. Those are not the ones I'm looking at, and you could see that as a shortcoming of the book, but otherwise people, I can't believe it. I, I, uh, other people have written about that history and very... And if I'm not mistaken, the Red Cross actually did something about this yeah, history. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and there have been documentaries devoted to it. In fact, this is actually the part of history that we've known all along. We've known about the pedo Maslama and an equally charged term, the pedo Sosimo of the pedo Philagma, the pedo boys of Queen Frederica, but we always thought it was only those two child movements, very politicized child movements, on both ends. On both ends. But what I'm saying is, the part that we've been forgetting all the time is the 4,000 children who were uh, adopted and then Greece forgot about them. And if it wasn't that these children, no, don't stick up their head off, uh, uh, there's still kind of a tendency to ask, did this really happen? And actually, that's the first question in the early phases of my research that I get. Do you actually even know anyone of them? As if, like, yes. They exist, they speak for themselves, 4,000. Can, can I ask you something? In, in the case of these 4,000 children, in the case of, of Mary here, who was the drunkard? Who was the drunkard? Maybe it was me who spilled the beans. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, that's, that's, have, that's, a, that's a startling realization. No, but and must, I feel like my wife. It must be somebody who actually you know, said something to these children. Because, I mean, you live in a family that's in America with your parents, and perhaps you're you not worried about your... <laughs> Your origin, whatever you do, you are American. But well, it, well, it is, they talk to each other. They talk to each other. Social media, they find each other, they find me. Sooner or later, they all Google something and they find us. And, and now this topic looms large. If you go on the internet, this pops up. 
and they find each other and word of mouth and and there's a whole network of people talking right now. But yeah, I, I mean the thought that I may actually be the drunkard. <laughs> Okay, let's, uh, let's adjourn and continue our discussion over the bar. Thank you so much.